Hello dear friends. In this video lecture I want to talk about spin echoes. Spin echoes are frequently observed and used in magnetic resonance. Many NMR and EPR methods rely on spin echoes. Briefly spin echo can be described as refocusing of spin magnetization. Okay, let me give you an example of a system which can exhibit spin echo depending on application of electromagnetic pulses. Here I will consider a rectangular prismatic sample containing spin magnetic moments placed into external magnetic field B0. Indeed, such specific shape of the sample is not truly really necessary, but it may help me to explain the appearance of the spin echoes. Initially, the spin magnetic moments are oriented preferably along the B0 field, and as we know, they can be flipped to the transversal plane by an electromagnetic pulse. For example, the magnetization can be oriented along the x-axis of the rotating frame if we apply an electromagnetic pulse with B1 field oriented along the y-axis. Okay, let's look at this system from above. Here we have magnetic moments oriented along the x-axis. Expectedly, such state cannot exist for a long time. The magnetic moments will start to process around the B0 direction or Z direction, and it's unusual to expect that they will process with the same angular frequency in the whole sample. For simplicity, let us assume that we have a gradient of magnetic field B0 along the x-axis. Such gradient will lead to the variation of the angular velocity of the magnetic moment precession, which can defocus the initial magnetization. To characterize this process, I'll be introduce discrete values of the x-coordinate x1, x2, x3, and so on along the sample x direction. Also, I will assume that the value of B0 field is weaker at the top of the sample and increases as we move from x1 to x2 to x3 and so on. Now, the question is how the spin magnetic moments will process in such magnetic field with a gradient. Okay, let's start with the position x1. Here the contribution from the field gradient is small, and I can say that the angle of precession of magnetic moments is equal to zero in some rotating frame. Hence, the orientation of the spin magnetic moments remains almost the same as it was immediately after the application of the first electromagnetic pulse. If we move further to the position x2, the magnetic field B0 becomes larger. This can make the precession angle of the spin magnetic moments already visible. For the reason of demonstration, let's say this rotation is about 45 degrees as shown here. At the position x3, the precession angle will become even larger. So we can go further. As a result, we can get almost all orientation of the spin magnetic moments in the sample available. OK, now let us make some quantitative estimation of our processing spin magnetic moments. The spin magnetic moments at the position x1 can be characterized by a vector m1, which has two components, m1x and my2, since it lies in a xy plane. Such two-dimensional vector 
can be represented by a complex number with a real part equal to mx1 and the imaginary part equal to m1y. Now I will take the advantage out of the fact that the magnitude of the vector m1 does not change during the precession. This allows me to represent the complex number m1 in an exponential form characterized by the phase phi1. The accumulated phase phi1 is proportional to the product of the time t and the angular velocity omega1, which in turn is proportional to the coordinate x. Therefore, our magnetization vector m1 can be presented as an exponential complex number e to the power i a x1 t, where the coefficient 8 reflect the gradient of magnetic field p0. Similarly, I can characterize the magnetizations at the position x2, x3, and so on. Okay, let us now determine the total magnetization of the sample and how it depends on time. For this, we need to sum all spin magnetization contributions from each position in the sample. So we obtain a sum of our exponential functions, which can be substituted by an integral by introducing the sample length L. The value of this integral is given by this time-dependent formula. This expression has a real and imaginary part. The real part is a sync function of the product A, L, and T. And the imaginary part is equal to 1 minus cosine of ALT divided by ALT. Now I can plot the real and the imaginary parts of the function m of t, which correspond to the x and y components of the spin magnetization respectively. Hence, we obtain that the initially large x component of spin magnetization decays as the time goes on. The imaginary part, or the y component of magnetizations, exhibits some oscillations due to precession mo motion of magnetic moments, but for a long time these oscillations decay to zero also. Just to remind, the green curve is here the real or x component of the spin magnetization, and the violet curve is the imaginary or the y component of the magnetization. Okay, let us go now back to the figure showing the orientation of spin magnetic moments in the sample. I will make a copy of it. Now, let us apply an electromagnetic pulse, which rotates spin magnetic moments around the x-axis by an angle pi. This will give us a new sample state where all magnetic moments are mirror reflected with respect to the x-axis or x-z plane. After this inversion pulse, it is easy to express the value of spin magnetic moments if we knew their values before the pulse application at time point tau. We just need to substitute the accumulated phases of the magnetic moments by their opposite negative values. It means that the magnetic moments 
at the position x1 now can be expressed via e to the power minus a i x1 tau. At the position x2, the values of magnetic moments can be characterized by e to the power by minus i a x2 tau, and so on. Now the question is, what the magnetic moments will do after the pulse is switched off? They will do the same what they did before the pulse. They will continue process in the magnetic field B0. And the angular velocity of the magnetic moment procession will be preserved at each individual position. With this, I can calculate the evolution of the magnetic moment phases after the second inversion pulse taking into account the phase value created during this pulse. Hence, I can say that the magnetic moment at the position x1 is getting additional phase a x1 t minus tau. Similarly, at the position x2, the magnetic moment accumulates additional phase a x2 t minus tau and so on and so on. Very interesting. Let us look now at the time when t is equal to 2 tau. We will see that at 2 tau all the exponential factors describing the spin magnetic moments become equal to 1. It means that all spin magnetic moments vectors in the sample are pointing in the same direction along the x-axis as it was at the beginning. Such a refocusing of the spin magnetization which leads to the increase of the observed signal is called spin echo. The first spin echoes were detected by Erwin Hahn in the middle of 20th century. Okay, let us do again a quantitative estimation of the total sample spin magnetization after these two electromagnetic pulses, pi half and pi, separated by a time gap tau. As before, we need to add all individual magnetic moments described by complex exponential factors, substitute the sum with an integral, and perform the integration. Since uh, these expressions are very similar to the expressions which we had after the first pulse, I will obtain a similar result is only different that the time t needs to be substituted with t minus 2 tau. Now I can plot the total sample spin magnetization in the whole time window from 0 to 2 tau. It means before the application of the inversion pulse at time tau and after this pulse. Basically, the total sample spin magnetization after the first pass before the second pass was already plotted above, and I will take this plot here. For the time period from tau to 2 tau, I will use the last formula. With the green color, I am plotting the real or the x component of the sample spin magnetization. And with the violet color, I am plotting the imaginary or y part of the spin magnetization. This plot shows that the sample spin magnetization recovers completely and at the time 2 tau, we obtain the same value of the spin magnetization as it was at the time 0. 
Hence, this demonstrates again the appearance of the spin echo. Ok, let me conclude at the end. In this video I have demonstrated how a spin echo can be formed with two pi and half and pi pulses. Remarkably, I would like to point out that a spin echo can be formed with other pulses which are not exactly pi half and pi, but the quantitative analysis procedure is similar in such cases. With this, I would like to finish my video lecture to invite you to watch other my videos related to magnetic resonance and to thank you for your attention and watching this video. Bye-bye.